Hi, Ken. Domenico, it's good to see you, Ken. It's been a long, long time. Hope you're doing well, Ken. Good. Hello, Anne. Hope you and God are doing well. Good to see you. Hi, Ken and Marilyn. It's good to see you all again. Thank you for joining us. Well, Kim, we keep praying for you. We know it's been tough. You're right, but uh, God is still uh, in control. And so uh, we want you to know that we have been praying for you, and we hope that you're doing well. Okay, we are going to make a start. Let me uh, take this time to welcome all of you to our Wednesday night Bible study. As uh, all of you know, we all look forward. Uh, I, in particular, look forward to uh, this uh, very special time when we can uh, you know, meet our God, uh, meet one another uh, remotely, and yet in spirit we are connected. Uh, and so uh, we are so glad that we have this opportunity to uh, huddle around God's Word and, and allow God to refresh us and uh, to uh, teach us. We're going to pray, we're going to enter into a time of prayer, and uh, we want to thank God for uh, the events of, uh, of today, that uh, everything passed off very well. Uh, no uh, uh, misfortune. We also are going to uh, remember the uh, events for tomorrow as we uh, meet with our new senior pastor, uh, with the staff, and of course with the church council, and then Friday with the uh, deacons, Saturday with the uh, with the whole church. Those who are able to uh, be here in person from 1 to, uh, p.m. to 2 p.m. on Saturday. And of course, you can also join in virtually. You can watch uh, 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 because we will be live streaming. So you can actually join us. And of course, Sunday, uh, Pastor Jeff would preach his introductory sermon uh, to all of us. So I'm going to ask you um, kindly to bow your heads with me as we uh, go to the Lord in prayer this time. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you so much for this time that you have appointed for us to meet with you first of all and of course to meet with uh, each other virtually we know that uh, we are socially distanced from one another physically uh, but we are connected by your spirit and so we are grateful tonight father we just want to uh, thank you for the uh, inauguration and uh, for your presence and your protection for uh, our elected officials and of course for our men and women in uniform who uh, as always um, are so dedicated and commitment to this uh, this great land and so lord we pray for the new administration and we ask that uh, your blessing will continue to attend them that you'll be with mr biden and uh, kamala and uh, with all the uh, our senators and uh, our congressmen uh, and we also father pray for their families that uh, you will be with them and protect them during this very difficult time 
We, Father, also want to thank you for this great country. It is a great country, and we thank you for all the opportunities, for all the freedoms that we enjoy. And what we witness today is a testimony to this, uh, the resilience of this great land. And so, Lord, we just want to pray especially for this uh, country. We ask that you will continue to pour your blessings upon this, this great land. You will bless um, everything that uh, takes place here. We pray, Father, uh, that uh, uh, you will also be in the midst of the pandemic, which uh, has claimed uh, over 400,000 lives. Lord, no life is, um, uh, is less precious in your sight. And so we mourn with those families and uh, friends of ours who are mourning uh, the loss of family members, uh, community members, co-workers. Uh, Father, we ask that your comfort and your peace and the assurance of your, uh, of, of your grace will be with them. Tonight, Father, we also want to pray for our church family. We have waited for uh, over a year to get our senior pastor and Lord, you have opened the way. And so we pray for Pastor uh, uh, Willett, uh, Jeffrey, and uh, his family as they prepare to uh, step into uh, uh, this uh, great um, uh, space that you've created for them, this great opportunity to uh, come and, and lead your church and grow your church and uh, bless this community in which your church is located. Uh, Father, we ask for protection for him and his family. We also ask that you will give him the vision and uh, all that he needs. You will equip him so that he will indeed come and just take this church uh, to uh, that new level. Father, we know that your church will continue to uh, grow from strength to strength. It is your body. And uh, you call men and women into positions of authority and responsibility. And Father, we ask that you will anoint our Pastor Wallet that you will make his leadership here a blessing to your church, uh, to our members, and to this uh, great community of Fairfax here. Lord, we pray for all the meetings that have been scheduled beginning tomorrow with the staff and uh, with the church council, and Friday with the deacon board, and uh, of course Saturday uh, with the uh, uh, entire church, those who are able to be here in person and those who will be watching uh, uh, again virtually that everything will go well it will be a time of uh, excitement a time of rejoicing and a time of, uh, of blessing Father we celebrate your goodness to us and we celebrate all that you do for our church we also pray for the service on Sunday that again it will be a spirit filled service one in which all our hearts and minds will be drawn heavenward a time of rejoicing and a time of celebration as Pastor Jeff uh, uh, breaks your bread of life to us. And so, Lord, now we thank you for this time. And we ask that you will bless our conversations, you will bless our interaction uh, with you, and of course, with one another virtually, and that at the end, we will know that indeed we have been blessed, and that indeed you have uh, opened your word to us. So, Father, we just want to thank you, and we pray for each member for those who have had a difficult time, we remember Kim with the loss um, of, of, uh, of, of, of dad. And, and Father, we pray for many others who are also mourning at this time. And those who need your special healing grace, that you will continue to touch them. And so, Father, allow us to be refreshed, to be restored by you. Because we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you, and we are going to uh, uh, turn our Bibles to Second Chronicles chapter 34, and we will look at the first 21 verses. Uh, and uh, let me uh, read, uh, and you can follow me in your uh, Bible in whatever translation you have, and then uh, after that we will look at the introduction and then get into our discussion proper. So Second Chronicles chapter 34. And I will begin from verse 1. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. Hi there, uh, Norelita. We're glad that you're able to join us. We're looking at um, Second Chronicles 34 verse 2. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And walked in the ways of David his father. 
and he did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Verse 3. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet a boy, he began to seek the God of David his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the Asherim, and the carved and metal images. And they chop down the altars of the Baals in his presence, and he cut down the incense altars that stood above them. And he broke in pieces the Asherim, and the carved and the metal images, and he made dust of them, and scattered it over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. Verse 5. He also burned the bones of the priests on their altars, and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And in the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim, and Simeon, and as far as Naphtali, in the ruins all around, he broke down the altars, and beat the Asherim and the images into powder, and cut down all the incense altars throughout all the land of Israel. Then he returned to Jerusalem. Verse 8. Now in the eighteenth year of his reign, when he had cleansed the land and the house, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, and Masiah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of jo jo Joas, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. They came to Hilkiah the high priest and gave him the money that had been brought into the house of the Lord which the Levites, the keepers of the threshold, had collected from Manasseh and Ephraim and from all the remnant of Israel and from all Judah and Benjamin and from the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And they gave it to the workmen who were working in the house of the Lord. And the workmen who were working in the house of the Lord gave it for repairing and restoring the house. They gave it to the carpenters and the builders to buy quarried stone and timber for binders and beams for the buildings that the kings of Judah had let go to ruin. Verse 12. And the men did the work faithfully. Over them were set Jath, Jahath and Obadiah the Levites of the sons of Meriah and Zechariah and Meshulam and the sons of the Kohathites to have oversight. The Levites, all who were skillful with instruments of music, were over the burden bearers and directed all who did work in every kind of service. And some of the Levites were scribes and officials and gatekeepers. While they were bringing out the money that had been brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah, the priest, found the book of the law. of the Lord given through Moses. Verse 15. Then Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. Shaphan brought the book to the king and further reported to the king. All that was committed to your servants they are doing. They have emptied out the money that was found in the house of the Lord and have given it into the hand of the overseers and the workmen. Then Shaphan the secretary told the king, Hilkiah the priest is giving me a book. And Shaphan read from it before the king. Verse 19. And when the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah, Ahikam, and the son of Shaphan, Abdon, the son of Micah, Shaphan, the secretary, and Isaiah, the king's servant, saying, Go, inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and in Judah, concerning the words of the book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out unto us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord, to do according to all that is written in this book and so you notice the very last verse verse 21 for great is the wrath the anger of 
the Lord, that is Yahweh, that is poured out on us. Why? Because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. And so when we neglect the commands of God, when we neglect the tender promptings of God's Spirit that continues to speak to us, then what um, uh, the king um, uh, Josiah said to the people of Israel is precisely what is going to happen to us. May God forbid. And so with that introduction, let me just read uh, the first paragraph of our introduction to kind of situate this lesson for us. The kingdom of Judah had been led into sin and rebellion by her unfaithful kings. Now that should not surprise us because in our study over the past uh, months and years, at least we've seen that that seemed to, to be the pattern for Israel. Israel continued in her rebellion, in her disobedience, and in her sin against God. Uh, and the reason why we spend time to study these things is so that we will draw some vital lessons and we will not continue to repeat or we will not do uh, the same things that uh, the children of Israel did and incurred the wrath, incurred the, the punishment and the condemnation of God. Now the book of the law had been lost and the people had become idol worshippers. Now for those of you who, uh, who listened to our sermon last uh, Sunday, idolatry is uh, perhaps one of the uh, most insidious, perhaps the greatest sin that is taking this world captive. And we notice how it did take uh, uh, God's people um, you know, uh, captive and led them into sin and into destruction. And so the book of the law had been lost and the people had become idol worshippers. But young King Josiah sought to honor God. Now that is a very beautiful uh, phrase. Young King Josiah determined purpose in his heart as Daniel and his three friends did in the book of Daniel to worship God, to honor God and to refrain from idolatry. I pray that you and I will make the same commitment to the God who has loved us lavishly and had given him himself through Jesus Christ for your sin and for my sin. And so King, young King Josiah sought to honor God. So we see him on a great venture or a great adventure of destroying all the idols throughout the land of Israel. Yet, when King Josiah came face to face with the holiness of God revealed through the accidental discovery of God's word, which is the law of God, God's word that had been kept in the temple, he repented and led one of the greatest reforms and reformation that the, the world has ever witnessed. After Josiah's repentance, he restored the worship of God and greatly influenced the culture of his uh, you know, people and the culture of his country, of his land. Josiah found his purpose in the worship of God through his repentance. But what we know is that what was occurring there was really pointing forward to Jesus Christ. And so my last statement there is, however, while Josiah was a, a good and a great king God used to lead his people back to himself, he was not a perfect king, as we all know. Uh, and the people needed somebody more than that. Uh, the point is that we can thank God, we can praise God, that Jesus is the righteous king of kings and lord of lords. And Jesus is the one who went the way of the cross to bring us to God. And by paying that penalty which you and I should have paid, that penalty of destruction and death, Jesus has given us our forgiveness, mercy, and has given us that righteousness to live for Him. And so we're going to look at three uh, items here. The first is repentance involves removing 
and destroying idols. You know, it's really interesting that sometimes we say, well, I, I just, I want to serve God, but it's still okay for me to uh, still uh, do the things that I love to do. Uh, I want to serve God. And, you know, God understands, you know, we are very weak people and therefore God knows my weak frame and therefore it's okay for me to continue to do the things I love to do and at the same time worship God. It doesn't work like that. Repentance involves removing and destroying all those things that pose a hindrance, obstacle between us and God. Repentance, as we know, is making a U-turn from the, from the way that you are headed and turning back to the God who made you and the God who redeemed you and me from destruction. And so, Josiah served as a godly leader to his people. And he made tremendous reforms for his land. I believe that like Josiah, you know, or, or, you know, something that we all do all the time, he could easily have been overwhelmed. He could easily have said, Lord, this is too much for me. I just cannot handle this. And we saw this even with one of the greatest prophets you know, of all time, Elijah. He could easily have been overwhelmed. He could easily have turned his back to God. He could easily have thrown in a towel. But what do we see? Rather, we see him boldly confronting the idols of his time. He made this bold assault on the evil that he saw within his country, within his sphere of influence. Remember, he made a bold assault. Sometimes our silence as Christians means that we acquiesce and we support what is going on. Uh, God has called us to be the life changers, you know, people that will turn or uh, help people to turn from their wicked ways to the God who alone can save us. And sometimes it's good for us to speak out. Sometimes it's good for us to speak out in love uh, and, uh, you know, let people know that we serve a God who does not condone sin. He is a God of love, and yet it is His desire that all of us should turn from our wicked ways and come to uh, that uh, knowledge of salvation uh, in Him. So what did Josiah, what uh, were some of the things that he did? What did he do? Josiah waged war against the evil in his kingdom because he was humble and repentant before God. Now this is really important. I cannot write a check for you if I don't have money in my account in the bank. And I've said this before, my wife tells me it's an offense in the state of Virginia, in the Commonwealth. You could easily be jailed for knowingly writing a check to somebody when you know you don't have money in the account. Now, all that I'm trying to suggest here is that I cannot give what I don't have. If I want to make an impact on somebody, I got to live the Christian life. I got to love the person. I got to show them what it takes to be a child of God. Now, sometimes you've heard people say, well, you do what I say, but not what I do. Well, it doesn't work like that in the Christian realm. Because we know that the Lord and Master that we serve, Jesus Christ, modeled for us. He lived that example so that we too will uh, know how to live to please God. And so, one of the things that we know about this young king, Josiah, was that he purposed in his heart. He determined to wage war against the evil that he saw within his kingdom. Because his heart was right with God. He was humble before God and he was repentant before God. I just want to emphasize this point that we cannot please God on our own. It's not possible. In fact, even the um, act of repentance is a divine grace. It is God's work on us through His Spirit. None of us can be repentant. None of us can turn from our evil ways on our own. By nature, we have this 
great propensity toward evil, toward sin. That is why it breaks the heart of God when we stubbornly and persistently refuse to heed the tender promptings of God through His Spirit. God knows that we are weak by nature to do anything good for ourselves. And that's why He came through Jesus Christ. All that we have to do, ladies and gentlemen, my Christian friends, is to say, Lord, I acknowledge my weakness. I know that I am frail, that I have no power on my own to withhold and to withstand the, um, you know, the assaults of the devil. But I can and I am able to overcome sin through your power in Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit that God has given to us. That is our only defense. We are able to do it. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so tonight, I just want to encourage you and encourage myself that we don't need to do this on our own. That we have our defense in Jesus Christ. When we are confronted with a problem and we know we don't have an answer, a solution to it, we know where to find the, the solution. Take it to the Lord in prayer. When we are battling a situation in our lives, maybe in the life of a family member, in the life of a spouse, in the life of even a friend, we know where to find the answer. Let us take it to the Lord in prayer. Josiah was humble at heart. Josiah was repentant at heart. And because of that, he was able to do great and mighty things for God, even though he was a young man when he came to the throne. And so you can see there in the uh, italicized statement there, lasting reform only comes from true repentance. Enduring lasting reforms can only come from within, from a heart that is in tune with God. We can always hope and pray for our leaders to do the same. But not only for our leaders, but for ourselves. I need to do it through God's power. I need to model it as an associate pastor. You as a member of our church, you need to do your part. By doing our part collectively, we are able to move the kingdom of God forward. And I'm particularly excited as we welcome our senior pastor that we can all come together when this pandemic is over. And even before it's completely eradicated, we can still do our part within our communities, within our homes, with our friends, as we share the good news of what God is doing for this world uh, through Jesus Christ. We can also look at Josiah's life and apply his example of repentance and reform to our own lives. There are three elements about Josiah's life that I believe should encourage us to uh, look at his life and to model what he did. The first, his age. If we go back to our scripture reading, look at you know, uh, Second Chronicles chapter 34 and verse 1. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. When he began to reign, in other words, to rule his country, he was only eight years old. And I know that he obviously would have uh, been guided by some senior elder statesmen, but he knew what he had to do. In fact, he reigned for 31 years, and if you, you know, continue to, reign, you know, to read, in, you know, uh, in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet a boy, look at verse 3, in the eighth year of his reign, and so he was eight years when he began to reign, 16 years still, you know, he began to seek the God of David, his father, 16 years old. I have a 16-year-old in my house. And, uh, you know, we've all been there. They think they know everything. They see only in binaries, black and white. And they, they will tell you, mom and dad and uh, our senior folks, daddy, this is the way you ought to do it. Well, we need to let them grow. And that's okay. But you can see here, Josiah was 16 years old when he put his heart to pursue God. When he sought God with his own all you know his whole heart now that is an incredible piece of of uh, of news for us his age 
He was only 16 when he committed his way to the Lord. And when we actually, um, you know, read uh, down, you notice that he was just 20 years old when he started implementing those reforms in his land. It's kind of interesting to see why he would do these things at that ripe age. I think the only conclusion we can draw is he, his heart was right. My Christian friends, when our heart is right, it doesn't matter how old we are, how advanced in age we are, how young we are, as long as our heart is right with God, God can and will use us to do mighty exploits, to do great things for God. And so, Josiah started young, but his heart was right. God can call people of any age, young or old, to repentance and to seek, uh, you know, to send uh, us on a journey for his glory. Number two, Josiah's territory, or I mean history. Now, if you read the preceding chapters, you notice that Josiah was not raised with the example of a repentant father. In fact, he was um, the, the, the grandson of terrible kings who had gone before him who were idol worshippers. So more than likely, Josiah's first religion was one of idol worship because that's what he knew. He was raised in that kind of environment. And so that kind of history was there for him. Uh, but he became a worshiper of the one true God. How did that happen? The history of Josiah was not one that was really pretty at all. In fact, if he were just to uh, look at his history, there was no way he would have moved from that place of idol worship to that point where he gave his heart completely you know, to God. I think there's a huge lesson here. Your circumstances, your history, your background should not be determinative, should not solely determine how you relate to God. Your background, the, the place you were born, the kind of environment in which you grew, yes, they could shape you a bit, but they should not you know, hold you captive to the sins of this world. Josiah's history, his background was not that good. And yet he was able to allow God to use him to, as I said, to actually uh, accomplish one of the greatest reforms that the world has ever you know, known or witnessed. And so, he is an example to us. Like Josiah, we must recognize that our history and our past do not determine our future. The only thing that will determine your future and my future is being repentant and being humble before God. Living out our faith and allowing God to use us for his glory. And so we notice that his age was not an obstacle, was not a hindrance. Your age, my age, should not be a hindrance, an obstacle to the way God is able to use us. Our history, where we were born, how we were raised, Yes, they may pose a challenge to us, but when God opens up opportunities for us to get to know God, I just want to encourage us to seek God with our whole heart, because here is an example from Josiah, this young king, who will not allow his history and circumstances to determine his relationship with God. Rather, he will allow his heart he would allow what God is able to do for him, the guidance and the leadership, the direction of God, to guide him and to lead him to uh, a place uh, where he would be an example to others. Third, Josiah's community. Josiah's first responsibility was for his own repentance. You know, I've shared this with you uh, when you are on the plane and you know, they, they give the announcements and they try and show you all the safety features. They will tell you, in, in case of uh, any misfortune, 
make sure you put on your own mask before you help somebody else because if you are able to do that then you can be a, you know you are able to help others also survive so josiah's first responsibility was for his own repentance to be sure that he was right with god because once his heart was right with god he was able to help others to also become right with god second as king he was to lead the people in repentance by his example and action now that's very important by his example and action well you may say but pastor daniel i'm not even a deacon i'm just an ordinary member well remember you know first peter chapter you know one verse nine going says that we are priests we are kings you know we are part of god's priesthood and so you are a priest you know baptists believe in the priesthood of all believers in other words god has tasked you and me with this responsibility as priests we ought to lead people to god yes you may not be a king you may not be a princess or a prince but you are a priest and you are a priest that you know a, 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 a priest that god is called to actually uh, bring people to him and so josiah took responsibility for his own repentance and then as king he took responsibility for his people tonight i want you to see that josiah determined and purpose in his heart he could not force a hard change within his community but he could do as much as possible through his own influence his own attitude through his own action and through his own uh, activity you know uh, no matter what we do and no matter what we say I want us to know that we are a tremendous force in the hand of God as long as we allow God to use us as long as we allow God to prepare us the world cannot and will not be able to face us when we are in the hands of the Almighty God when we humbly and in repentance allow God to shape us allow God to fortify us allow God to strengthen us and allow God to use us as a force for good tonight I don't want you to belittle yourself I don't want you to say Lord I cannot do it because I'm only you know just an ordinary member where well, God knows who you are and God knows what God is able to do through you for his kingdom's sake you see one of the things that I want you to know tonight is that don't attempt to attack the devil on your own the Bible says and Peter says it flee from the devil Put a huge distance between you and the evil one and allow God to be there to fight the devil. You know, what the devil doesn't like is when the devil has to face God. When the devil has to face you, you are no match. I am no match because remember, he has been around for so many years. He knows all the tricks. But when the devil has to confront the God of creation, the devil flees. And so, many of us try to do things on our own we try to even attack evil idolatry the weakness in our lives the sin in our own lives with the brute force of human willpower well let me tell you you are bound to fail it is an ill fated attempt because you cannot in fact i remember what pastor chino said when he preached two weeks ago we all make resolutions come end of the year Barely two weeks into January, we see that all those resolutions just fall by the wayside. Why? Because we think we can do it on our own. We think we are able to do it because we have the willpower. I think the world is there to show us. You yourself have seen that. You witnessed that. That you cannot. See, these attempts will leave us disappointed, tired, and disillusioned. And in fact, they are so dangerous for us because... They often will just you know let us give up and even make shipwreck of our faith. Well, tonight I'm here to give you good news. 
we are too weak to effect any lasting change in our lives but repentance which is a gift from God which is God's grace is all that we need to be successful and to accomplish our mighty things for God repentance is that grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ repentance is key for godly living repentance is all that we need let me share with you a couple of verses from scripture you find all of them right there uh, in the handout the first one that I read is from the gospel of Matthew Matthew chapter 4 and look at verse 17 in Matthew 4 verse 17 for that time Jesus began to preach saying repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand ladies and gentlemen there's nothing we can do on our own to commend ourselves to God there is literally nothing that we can do to make ourselves stand in a right relationship with God the only thing that can help us is to let God take over to repent to allow the grace of God to lead us to that point of repentance so that God can and will help us in the gospel of Mark in Mark chapter 6 and verse 12 the author of Mark writes for us so they went out and proclaim uh, that that people should repent that is the message that we should take you know with us that the gospel of Jesus Christ is that gracious offer of repentance for the whole world and this repentance is an act of grace it's something that God does for us it's something that God gives to us again in Luke chapter 24 the gospel of Luke chapter 24 and verse 47 Luke 24 and verse 47 and this is what Jesus tells them when he meets the disciples after his resurrection and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in the name of Jesus uh, beginning in Jerusalem well we should begin from where we are we should begin from our homes from our churches from our communities we should proclaim the gracious offer of God's repentance and God's forgiveness to a world that is hurting a world that is in turmoil in the book of Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 Acts 2 and verse 38 Peter in a sermon said and Peter said to them repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit all that we need to live righteous life that will glorify God is to allow God to give us that gift that grace of repentance and forgiveness and so repentance involves accepting that grace from God and allowing God to destroy all those idols all those things that we hold dear I shared with you last week we don't worship idols of wood and stone and um, carved objects but we know that we have idols within materialism within our own egos and pride all the idols of lust all the idols that we have only God through Jesus Christ can help us to overcome those things repentance not only involves removing the idols destroying them through God's uh, uh, grace of uh, repentance and forgiveness but repentance involves restoring and resuming proper worship let's go back to our scripture reading and let me read again what I read look at uh, 2 Chronicles 34 verses 8 to 13 verses 8 to 13 now in the 18th year of his reign when he had cleansed the land so first of all he cleansed himself through God's grace as he repented and then he cleansed the, you know, the land by his action and by example and then he turned to the house of God now, this is remarkable for a young man of you know, you know of this ripe age and so what did he do he sent Shaphan the son of Azaliah 
and Messiah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of Joahaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. You know, to repair God's house, this is a spiritual endeavor. You know, when we give something to support the ministry, it is a spiritual act that we're doing. Yes, we give money, we give our time. These are things that we do, but it, they, 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 it's not really within those physical entities, but it's all within the spiritual application that we're looking at at this point. And so what did uh, Josiah do? Verse 9, they came to Hilkiah the high priest and gave him the money that had been brought into the house of the Lord, which uh, the Levites, the keepers of the threshold, had collected. Look at verse 10. And they gave it to the workers who were working in the house of the Lord. And the workmen who were working in the house of the Lord gave it for repairing and restoring the house. For repairing and restoring the house, they gave it to the carpenters, the builders, to buy stone, timber, binders, beams for the building that the kings had let go to ruin. And the men did their work faithfully. And uh, we, we know the end result. And so, Josiah turned his attention to restoring God's house, a place where people will meet to worship God. Josiah did this when he, you know, in his 18th year ruling over Judah, when he was only 26 years old. Yet he set his heart in honoring God and the worship of God. You know, it is really important that we take worship very seriously. You know, worship is one that springs from within us. Worship involves our attitude to God. What we're reading here, what we're talking about, honoring the temple of God is basically honoring God with his heart. Knowing that when he is in a right relationship with God, everything will be okay. And so what did he do? He got all the artisans, the uh, carpenters, you know, the Levites, all of them, all the tradesmen. And, uh, you know, he did something which the kings before him could not do. Things that his father and grandparents, uh, you, know, you know, you know, could not do. And what he did was he set his eyes and his heart, he purposed in his heart, to lead the people to worship God and to obey God right. To praise the Lord their God. To sing His praise. To worship God in the right way. You see, when we worship God in the right way, it sets the tone and it invites others to worship with us. Proper worship in itself is contagious. When we worship God right, others see that power and others who want to come and worship you know, with us. Opposite or conversely, when believers fail to live with the purpose of worshiping God through our various gifts and talents and time and all the things God is blessed us with, then our worship becomes barren and boring, ineffectual, non-efficacious, and nobody wants to join us to worship God. Tonight, I want you to know that there is excitement when we come to worship God. Your heart should excite you. Your heart should kind of, you know, really spring up within you. Because when you come to worship God, you come with an attitude of praise and celebration and worship. And that is what I want us to do as we move forward this year. We cannot be bored. We ought to live like the way Josiah lived because that is the only way others will want to come and worship with us. Why is the church not growing? Well, because we ourselves are lethargic. We are bored. We There is no excitement. So how can we invite others to come and serve God with us? I want you, I want myself, I want all of us to be excited about the God that we have come to taste. The God who is so good and gracious and powerful and good to us. Repentance also involves recovering and obeying God's word. 
God's word. Let's go back to our uh, our passage in Second Chronicles chapter thirty-four, and let me read from verse fourteen. While they were bringing out the money that had been brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law. Now listen to this: the book of the law that the that had been given through Moses. Then Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. Shaphan, the recorder or the secretary, brought the book to King Josiah and reported to the king all that has been taking place with the uh, uh, renovation of the temple and now that they found this book, all that, uh, you know, the book also entails, you know, Shaphan the scribe wanted the king to be aware of that. All that was committed to your servants, they are doing. They've emptied out the money that was found in the house of the, of the Lord and given it to the hand of the overseers. Then Shaphan the secretary told the king, Hekia the priest gave me a book and he read it before the king and here is the king's reaction look at verse 13, you know, 19 and when the king heard the words of the law he tore his clothes now that is a sign of repentance sometimes they will sit in ashes sometimes just tear your clothes and we saw king david doing that you know when uh, he was run away from his son absalom after he had uh, committed that uh, grievous sin against uh, uh you know uriah and look at verse 20. And the king commanded Hilkiah, Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, Abdon, the uh, secretary and all of them, go, inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. My Christian friends, ladies and gentlemen, Josiah's lack of knowledge about the book of the law may appear a little bit of a mystery to us. As some of his ancestors had obviously uh, uh, relied on the teaching of the book of the law, and we can read about this uh, in uh, Second Chronic uh, First Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 40. But it is possible that knowledge about the book had fallen so far from their minds because of their focus on the idolatrous worship that had taken the land captive. What is one thing having just you know, knowledge of something is another thing putting that knowledge into practice. We all know God's word. We quote from God's word. But the question is, do we live by the word of God? That is a question that you and I need to ask ourselves. And so it is possible that you know, that fervor, that enthusiasm, that excitement for God's word had waned. And so when Josiah heard these words afresh, his heart was cut to the soul, and he began to implement something for his entire nation. You see, when the book of the law was found, its power became evident once again. When the book of the law was read to the king, he tore his clothes because the words cut through him like you know a, a very sharp you know sword well tonight let me tell you something six centuries later after king josiah the very embodiment of the word of god jesus christ himself hallelujah came into this world not to condemn this world but to save this world Jesus is God's word incarnate, God's word embodied. Jesus died so that you and I, through this given and living word, will have eternal life. Let me read a couple of verses from the Gospel of John. John chapter 1. We know this very well, but it's always good to read God's word. John 1 and verse 1 and verse 14. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. Look at verse 14. And the Word became flesh 
and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the very word of God. And tonight, I am excited to share this word, this living, active word with you. Word of God that will change our hearts. Words of God that will bring repentance and forgiveness to us. In John chapter 3 and verse 17, let me read this. Let me start from verse 16 and then read verse 17. John 3, verse 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Look at verse 17. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the word of God. King Josiah, that young king, lived that word in his life through his repentance and the embrace of the forgiveness of God. Josiah did not allow his history, his environment, his background to be determinative of his relationship with God. Rather, he stepped out in faith, embracing the word of God, the word of the Lord that had been found in the temple, and he lived it out in his life. And he encouraged his subjects to do likewise. By action, by example, he modeled for them what the word of God should do in our lives. Tonight, I need to do, I need to live it. You need to do the same. We all need to live out God's word. And God, through that living, will bring others into a saving knowledge of his grace. The world is hurting, my Christian friends, ladies and gentlemen. We ought to be the eyes, the hands, the feet of Jesus to take the word of God into this world that is sometimes very dark. May we be in awe as we proclaim to the world the great grace of our God in Jesus Christ. Jesus, the offer of God's repentance into, you know, to the world. Jesus, the offer of God's grace into the world. Jesus, the offer of God's forgiveness into the world. May God bless you. May God bless us. May God bless this great country in which we live. As we do our part as God's priests and priestesses, as we take God's word and share but this world that is so dark. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty Father, creator of the ends of the earth, thank you for your word. You are the living word. You were the word that was found in that book of the law that had been kept in the temple away from the uh, priest Josiah and his subjects. And yet when it was recovered, Lord, it just cut down to the core and they were able to revive and they were able to uh, seek your face. Father, you have revealed yourself to us through that living word, Jesus Christ. May we embrace his love and his forgiveness and his repentance and may we be a blessing to others. Keep us safe, Father, and keep us well as we uh, prepare to meet our senior pastor. And bless this uh, country as we move forward and bring us all together through reconciliation and unity as we allow you to refresh us. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for spending this time with us. I hope you were truly blessed. And I hope you will continue to read uh, this passage of Second Chronicles chapter 34. And I hope you will continue to ponder and reflect and meditate on these great words here so that we will be the eyes, the hands, the feet of Jesus Christ and bless others. Thank you all, Anne, and thank you, everybody, and have a very good night. 
and uh, a good uh, restoration of our bodies. May God bless all of you. Thank you, Cheryl, and um, thank you, everybody. God bless you.